Okay, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, guest speakers, to Brene Britt, and to Jewish Renaissance members, and to all our many visitors at home and around the world. First of all, I'd like to start by telling you about, about Brene Britt. We are the global voice of the Jewish people, and our mission is to bring Jews together from all sections of the community to work in friendship, to improve communal harmony, to strengthen the Jewish community, to combat racial and religious intolerance, and to help the less fortunate. But Abritt's core objectives are to advocate and defend human rights, to support the State of Israel and world Jewry, and to fight anti-Semitism, to support our charitable causes, especially in Israel and the Ukraine to foster friendships through social, cultural, and recreational programs, to encourage the participation of young people, to strengthen B'nai B'rit links internationally, and of course, to promote Jewish culture and heritage. It's through this last objective that we have participated in the European Days of cult Jewish Culture and Heritage for more than 20 years with our own BBUK Jewish Heritage Days program. The theme for 2022 is renewal, and this evening's B'nai B'rit main event has the title, What Lessons Can We Learn from Refugees of the Holocaust and How They Can Rebuild Their Lives to Help Us Better Understand the Situation Refugees from Ukraine Currently Face. When you receive the link for this meeting, the email mentioned that we make no charge for our meetings. However, it would be greatly appreciated if you could make a donation towards one of our charitable causes, that is the Ukraine Appeal or the food programme in Kiryat Gato, Israel. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Valerie Bellow, who is the chair of our BBUK heritage team, who has been responsible for promoting our programs since its inception so that she can introduce our guest speakers. Over to you, Valerie. Thank you, Eve, and good evening, everybody. It really is such a pleasure for me to introduce our two speakers to you, and we're absolutely delighted that they've consented to be in conversation for us this evening on a subject that is highly topical. Lord Dubs, who actually prefers to be called Alf, oh, is a Labour politician and leading refugee rights advocate. He was MP for Battersea between 1979 and 1987, during which time he served for four years as a Shadow Home Office Minister. After leaving the Commons in 1987, he became the director of the Refugee Council and was appointed as a Labour Life Peer in 1994. In 1997, after Labour's election victory, he was appointed as a minister in Northern Ireland, where he served until the establishment of a new devolved administration following the Good Friday Agreement. In 2016, he sponsored an amendment which later became known as the Dubs Amendment to the Immigration Act of 2016 to offer some unaccompanied refugee children stranded in camps in Europe safe passage to Britain, having himself arrived in Britain in 1939 as a six-year-old refugee fleeing the Nazis in Czechoslovakia. Currently, he serves on the Joint Committee on Human Rights he also serves on the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly and on the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Parliamentary Assembly. He continues to campaign on human rights and specifically, of course, for refugees. Professor Shirley Gilbert is Professor of Modern Jewish History. She's a specialist in that subject with particular interest in the Holocaust and its legacies, modern Jewish identity 
and Jews in South Africa. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Modern History from the University of Oxford and was a postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows at the University of Michigan. Before coming to University College, she was Carton Professor of Modern History and Director of the Parks Institute for Jewish and Non-Jewish Relations at the University of Southampton. She has done a considerable amount of work on research and has published books as well. Too many for me to single out, but um, one of them is on music in the Holocaust. But, and the most recent is Holocaust Memory and Racism in the Post-World War, Post-War World. And she is currently engaged in researching South African Jewish identity from the 1940s to the present. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our speakers. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Valerie, uh, for such a lovely, warm introduction. Um, thank you also, uh, Aviva and Eve, on behalf of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center um, for inviting me to take part in this event. And thanks also to Lydia for all the work behind the scenes to, to make sure this all um, flowed smoothly. It is such an honor to have this opportunity to talk about uh, this really important topic with Lord Dubs, with Elf. Um, who, as he would like to be known, whose presence in our public and political life is such an inspiration. Um, it, it really is an honor to, to be in conversation with you. Uh, before I jump into our conversation, I just wanted to take a moment to remember Barbara Winton, um, who passed away less than six weeks ago, aged just 68. Uh, Barbara was the daughter of Sir Nicholas Winton, who saved the lives of 669 Jewish children from Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, among them ELF, under the Kinder Transport Scheme. Um, Barbara Winton was a tireless promoter of her father's legacy. Some of you may be aware of the biography she wrote of him. She was also a determined campaigner in her own right. Um, and I, I wanted to quote briefly from a recent piece that she wrote about her father. She said, I believe that my father's work 80 years ago could set an example of a positive way to respond to the ongoing refugee crisis across the world. My father's motto was, if something is not impossible, there must be a way of doing it. My father's wish for his biography is that it should not promote hero worship, but if anything, that it might inspire people to recognize that they too can act ethically in the world and make a positive difference to the lives of others in whatever area they feel strongly about, whether it be international crises or nearer to home. Um, and certainly, Alf, having met you um, 15 minutes ago, that, that same spirit of, you know, this not being about hero worship, but really about making a positive difference in the world um, really certainly resonates. Um, I know that you recently attended two um, different memorial events related to the kinder transport. I wondered if you wanted to relate those briefly for us before I before I jump in with my first question. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank, uh, and th thank you for the in in introduction. Let me talk about the two events. But first of all, Barbara Winton, uh, she was a terrific person. She was a real campaigner for refugees. And even when she knew she was not going to live that much longer, she said what she wants to do till her dying day is to go on working in her father's memory, committed to refugees. She was very special indeed. The two events I recently attended, which are interesting, they're topical. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was an event at Harwich. Harwich was a place where most of us who came on a kinder transport arrived from the Hook of Holland, having traveled from Czechoslovakia, Austria or Germany. And this was a fantastic event. Um, there was a statue made of children who'd, who'd arrived, and there were the mayor was there, there were local people, the MP, and so on. And it was important in terms of uh, influencing public opinion. This is what happened. This is a contribution that was made. And it was a great privilege for me to be able to be there and take part in the events. The other event was in, was near Prague, and I came back from came back from Prague the day before yesterday, <clears throat> and that was an event run by an organisation, um, I think a mainly Jewish organisation in Prague, and they they wanted to plant trees in memory of Nicky Winton, and they did so in a small town about thirty miles outside Prague, where the, the village had made available an avenue, and we planted the trees 
uh, as it were, to commemorate Nicky Winton, and we put little labels on them uh, as to the mem memory. And of course, one of them was put in memory of, of Barbara Winton as well. And, and Barbara's brother was there, and he played a prominent part. And it, it was uh, several hundred people came from Prague to this event. It was very moving, and uh, it's a good thing that events like this take place because they remind us of the importance of memory, of the importance of not forgetting what happened and of paying respect and tribute to people who are enormously helpful like Nikki Winton. Thank you. Well, yes. Um, so let's turn now to you um, as someone who has also taken up that call for action to, to make a positive difference in the lives of others. Um, among many other things, you have, of course, devoted a lot of your working life, your professional life, campaigning for refugee rights. Um, and so, of course, you will know better than most of us that the situation of refugees over the past few years has sadly continued to get worse rather than better. Um, according to the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, uh, there are over 100 million people today forcibly displaced, displaced around the world. Um, and that situation has deteriorated even further in recent months because of the ongoing war in Ukraine, of course. So I wondered if you could start by saying something about how you see the contemporary refugee crisis against the background of the past century, really, of refugee crises. Thank you. In 1938-39, Britain took 10,000 children on a kinder transport, or kid from kinder transport. And Britain, I think, was the only country that did that. Even the Americans said these are additional to quota. So it was, and there were some arguments in the House of Commons at the time, but Britain did it. And it was an enormous step in terms of saving the lives of people who wouldn't have, young people who wouldn't have survived the Holocaust. That was positive. Then in the immediate post-war post -war time, the world was sympathetic to refugees in a sort of way. And then gradually, it beca things became more difficult. Um, there were arguments about the Vietnamese boat people. There were arguments about what happened to the people in Bosnia. But even as regards Bosnia, Britain took several thousand people who had survived those terrible Serb camps uh, and, and offered them safety in this country. And then gradually things began to get more difficult. Uh, and it's a very sad comment on life that there was this hostility. I think if governments and leading politicians don't speak out on behalf of refugees and other vulnerable groups, then uh, then the cause of refugees suffers because the public uh, will, will, will take a lesson in terms of hostility to refugees, if that's what the government is saying. And I'm afraid the British government at the moment, uh, our Home Secretary uh, foremost, our present Home Secretary, uh, in displaying hostility to refugees and, and vulnerable people. Oh, they say nice things. But the effect of the policy is, is, is hostile. But if I can just comment on, on the wider world, I'm afraid what we're seeing, we're seeing in other countries as well, uh, hostility. Refugees are being pushed back from Greece to Turkey. They're being pushed back in, in, in the Balkans, in Croatia and, uh, and Serbia. Uh, and then, of course, we forget the million Rohingyas uh, who fled Myanmar. Uh, and who are in southern Bangladesh. Now, they're, they're not talked about very much because they're out of sight, out of mind. The television cameras don't get there. Uh, and then we had the enormous movement of people uh, in 2016. Angela Merkel, to her great credit, uh, she took a million uh, Syrians uh, in 2015-2016. She pleaded with other countries to share responsibility. And I'm afraid other countries did not step up to the mark. And I think that's a very severe condemnation of European policy and European governments and European, and European politicians. So um, th there wasn't that international sense anymore. And of course, things began to get pretty hostile. Um, I know the amendment was called after me. I, I, I never called it that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to call it parliamentary amendment after me, but that, that was the media for you. Um, at, at, any, at any rate, um, what happened with that, if I can just very briefly say, what happened with that amendment, or, unless I'm jumping to a later question, what happened with that amendment was, was that um, there were, we discovered there were some 70,000 uh, unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe. And so I moved my amendment. It happened that the, the legislation was going through parliament, so I just added the amendment. Um, I was asked by Theresa May, who was Home Secretary, if you want an insight into this, I was asked by her uh, uh, to withdraw the amendment. And I said, I couldn't possibly, uh, you know, I can't do it. And she said, um, well, if they, these children come, others will follow. 
And I said, but we can't turn our backs on young people who are sleeping in, in the horrors of the jungle in Calais or on the Greek islands or, or sleeping off, whatever. We can't turn our backs on them. Anyway, I, I, we parted company, uh, friendly but uh, opposed, uh, and the amendment passed the Lords by a big majority. It went to the Commons where it was defeated by a very small majority. It went back to the Lords, we made some changes to the wording, and then Theresa May summoned me in again and said she proposed to accept the amendment. Well and good, um, but she did it because public opinion had suddenly woken up to this. Public opinion had seen pictures of uh, um, Alan Kurdi, a little Syrian boy drowned on the Mediterranean beach. They'd seen the horrors of what was happening and public opinion woke up to it. That put pressure on MPs and they, and they were then going to support, support the amendment. I should say very quickly that although I'm a Labour politician, the point of my amendment and campaign for refugees is never to be the property of one party. It is a cross party, and I've always sought to get support across the political spectrum because otherwise we, we can't we can't move forward sensibly. May I just move far, fast forward very quickly to the Ukrainians? Now, uh, I think the public response to the Ukrainians was much more positive. I think. Partly, partly because we saw on our television cameras much more of what they were suffering in Ukraine than we'd seen in Syria or in the case of Afghans in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and so it brought it home to us, people in this country, uh, just what was at stake. And I think Europe opened its borders much more willingly, even, even though we did drag our heels a bit. And I've had some arguments with British government ministers about individual children who were stuck between wanting to escape from the horrors of the war in Ukraine and not being allowed into Britain because the Home Office wasn't too happy about it. Uh, I could go into the details, but I, I won't now. So uh, public opinion has sort of moved a bit, but I'm not sure how much it has moved because we still have the hostility of recent leg legislation, the National Indian Borders Bill, and we also have the um, we have the the, 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 the absolutely ridiculous and wrong plan to send refugees to, to Rwanda. Uh, various things are happening which which are totally unacceptable and the government still seem hell-bent on, on pursuing it. So there's an awful lot at stake in trying to get public opinion on side. Well, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're sketching out and particularly the relationship between government policy and public attitudes. So you've painted a picture of an international community that has been increasingly over the past decades, increasingly unwilling to accept refugees. Um, although certainly if one looks even at the Holocaust period, there there has there has never been a, a kind of overwhelming desire to accept refugees, but but what you've painted is the last decades that that situation has gotten even worse. Um, and I wanted to set that alongside an, an interesting statistic. So on World Refugee Day earlier this year, Ipsos conducted a survey and they released the survey that said that 78% of people that they surveyed in 28 countries believe that those fleeing war, persecution or natural disaster should be able to take refuge in another country. And they made a lot of the fact that this figure of 78% of the public um, supporting refugees is up from 70% in 2021. So it seems to suggest a growing public sympathy for the plight of refugees. Um, so I, I'm interested in, in how these two things sit alongside one another. On the one hand, uh, um, a government and international community that seems increasingly unwilling, and at the same time, a sense that public attitudes are shifting. I don't know whether it's the war in Ukraine that has helped to shift these attitudes or what you're thinking about that is. Well, uh, thank you. That's a good question, because if we look at what happened in Germany, Angela Merkel suffered in, in the elections in Germany some time ago, uh, an extreme right wing party took office. In Italy, an extreme right wing government has been formed. In Hungary, they've, they've been opposed to refugees for a long time. I mean, the government, the prime minister there said um, um, refugees are not our concern. We're only interested in white Christians. It's an extraordinary thing for a European Union country to say. And we've seen in Austria as well, we have seen extreme right-wing parties, uh, unfortunately, exploit the refugee situation for their own electoral advantage. That's why I say public opinion is so important, because one of the main safeguards we have in this country is to keep public opinion on side. And I welcome your statistics. I hope they will survive the test of the Home Secretary's policies, uh, which I read in the papers today how hostile uh, she intends to be to refugees. Maybe she won't get away with it. Uh, but um, I, I do think that we've got to get the public on our side, which is why I welcome the chance uh, here. But I, I, I like going to school particularly schools. I've been to a lot of schools and talked to them about, about refugees. And I have to say, schools get it. 
you know, school students really get it, they understand what's, what's happening. But other, other groups as well, and the faith groups have been terrific. And, and I, I've been to lots of synagogues and other events. And I should say the first time I visited the jungle in Calais, there were 12 of us, <coughs> including five rabbis, which isn't bad, five rabbis in one go. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but, sorry, if I could just say, but the serious answer uh, to repeat myself is that the public opinion can be a bit fickle. And it is very important that we all use our voices to counter some of the hostile uh, comments being made by leading uh, leading leading politicians, which, which I think are despicable in, in their negative approach. Because local communities want to be welcoming of refugees, but it's hard to do it if the government says well, these people shouldn't be here, they should be in Rwanda. Well, I, I wonder, I mean, the question that I have and that I suspect occurs to others is, what kinds of things can people do? I mean, it's very easy to feel helpless. You know, someone like you is is acting in all sorts of ways. Um, what are the kinds of things that people can do to make their voices heard? One hears the anti-refugee voices so much more prominently, I think, on social media, in the public realm, uh, um, and so on. Do you have suggestions for people? Well, it's it's not an it's not an easy one, um, but, but but I can throw out a, a few a, a few pointers. I mean, of course, I think it's important we talk to uh, young people in schools because young people in schools are the next generation and it's important that they understand what the situation is. But my point is are these. I think it's important that you, um, all of you listening in today, taking part in this, you talk to your MP. If your MP is sympathetic, pat, them on, pat him or her on the back. If your MP is not sympathetic, ask them why not. Um, point out to them. What, what the issues are and you'll you know you'll be aware of some of them we're discussing them now and and then uh, again you can talk to your local councils your local councillors local authorities can be very helpful in supporting local refugee organizations in helping with, with in education in, in in welfare support and so on the whole range of issues where local authorities can play a, a big part so it's important you let your voice be heard i think it's important uh, in synagogues uh, great places for uh, discussing uh, discussing the the cause of refugees and any other organisations of which of which of which you're members. Uh, I, I think you've got to spread the word and not let the anti-refugee hysteria be the only voice that is that that is heard by people. So it's it's quite a big agenda. But I, I've 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 talked to people and I've asked them and they do talk to their MPs and sometimes. It helps. Sometimes it doesn't help. But it's important that politicians who make decisions about our country and what's going on. It's important politicians know that there are many voices that support a humane human rights based policy to refugees in the traditions which we saw in 1938-39. It's an important message. So can I go back to the Dubs Amendment? Um, so you are, of course, a child refugee yourself. And, um, and as you were explaining, you've campaigned very hard for the UK to take specifically unaccompanied child refugees from Europe. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about your thinking on child refugees and why you've chosen to focus on this particular group. And I wondered particularly how your thinking on this relates to your own experience on the kinder transport, um, which of course famously or infamously didn't allow parents to join. And certainly in the historical literature, um, one of the concerns that's been um, voiced around the kinder transport was this idea that you know children were seen as as the innocents who could come but it was much more problematic the idea of accepting their parents so, so I wondered what you thought about all of that okay right that's a very complicated set of questions if, 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 I, if I may say I hope I, I, hope I can, can keep, keep, keep them all in front of me first of all could I say that my first amendment was for on behalf of children who didn't have any family in this country under the EU, there was something called the Dublin Treaty, and under one of its provisions, a refugee child in one EU country could ask to join relatives in another. So a Syrian boy in France could say ask to join an uncle in Birmingham. And, uh, and that worked on behalf of more children than my original. I, I did an amendment about that as well. My amendment was to the effect that Britain in leaving the EU, by the way, a disaster, uh, Britain in leaving the EU, uh, should negotiate to continue the provisions of the Dublin Treaty as, as regards child refugees, okay? And that passed in 2017, after a bit of parliamentary voting and so on. It was then taken out of the 2019 Act, shamefully, shabbily, uh, and, and, and pretty well the door, was then, the door was then closed. Now, why child refugees? Well, because 
they are the most vulnerable. Whether they've got family elsewhere, they are on their own. They are young people who've traveled sometimes for six months or a year, gone through the most terrifying of experiences, uh, and they're entitled to a decent life. Uh, and and unless somebody speaks up for them and does something, and public policy supports them, then they'll be, be left for a long time. I, I was very shocked when I went to the jungle in Calais. I've been there several times, but the first time I went, a lot of the jungle was still there. Half of it had been flattened. And in the shopping street in the middle of the jungle, uh, there were displays of tear gas canisters and rubber bullets. And I said, what are they for? And I was told that when the then French authorities, the previous French government, had wanted to clear half the camp, uh, they, they were using these. But I said, on refugees, why? And they said, well, in that part of France, the National Front uh, are very powerful in the Calais area. And the French, then French government was trying to show that they could be as tough as, as tough as the National Front. And I said, you don't defeat fascism by behaving like fascists. And, and then, of course, they cleared the rest of the camp and, 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 uh, and it's got even more difficult. And going there now, you see people sleeping young, not just children, but people sleeping under the trees. If you're a child and you've got a, if, if you're a young man, you've got, a, 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 and you're in Calais on a Greek island, and you've got a brother who says, I've got accommodation for you in the north of England, Surely the thing to do is to try and join join your brother for the sake of sake of a decent life, uh, and 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 uh, and sometimes it's a real battle to persuade. It was then; it's even more difficult now to persuade the government to say, "Look, uh, the most sensible thing is for, for there to be family reunion." So it's both my refugees. When I say my refugees, they're my amendment, which covered children who didn't have family here, and the government capped that number at arbitrarily at four hundred and eighty because they said local authorities could not find any more foster places. The model in Britain has been foster families up to the age of 16 or 17, and then supported accommodation if they're a bit older. Uh, and the government said they couldn't find any more local authorities. Well, with Safe Passage, one of the charities I work with, um, we, we found 1,500 places on offer from local authorities. There's a financial difficulty, of course, but the places that were on offer. Uh, and so that's why I say do talk to your, uh, do talk to your local, local authorities as well. I remember at the beginning of all this, um, uh, a rabbi from Finchley took me to see the, the, the leader of uh, um, Barnet Council to persuade the leader of the council that they should be more welcoming to refugees. And I was told he actually decided yes after the discussion. So, you know, these are all these are all the things, these are all the things that are happening. I don't know whether I've diverted your question into something else. If I have, forgive me. No, not at all. That was a wonderful answer. I mean, it does occur to me, you mentioned your your visit to the jungle in Calais. I have just coincidentally been reading a, a wonderful novel by a German novelist called Jen, Jenny Erpenbeck called Go Went Gone, which is based on her experiences talking with uh, African refugees in Germany. And one of the things that struck me about the novel was how much it humanizes the refugees to hear their stories. And actually, they're not the kinds of stories we hear a lot we don't really hear these individual stories. And I wondered if you could say just a little bit about the kinds of refugees you've met. I know you've visited other camps in different countries. Maybe if you can just say something about some of the young people and children that you have met. Well, uh, I mean, what they display is an impressive determination to find safety. Uh, and they've got, got, got been through terrible experiences. There's a Syrian boy who told me that he'd seen his father blown up in front of him by a bomb in Aleppo or Damascus. You know, how can anybody go on living a life as before when that terrible thing has happened? Now, we know from the Holocaust how awful things happened. And here we have another generation who've gone through terrible, terrible experiences. And mind you, they're very resilient, some of them. Uh, in fact, all the refugees I've met, uh, a lot of them displayed incredible resilience. Sometimes it covers an inner turmoil of inner pain, enormous inner pain. So we, we can't always judge refugees or refugee children by by the way they present themselves, first of all. Uh, and um, my experience when I was the refugee council and, and we had the Bosnians come, and there were many families there, but um, I found some of them were desperate to talk. They arrived at Stansted Airport, the world's media were there. Some of them were desperate to talk about their experiences. Others did not want to talk at all. <clears throat> One has to respect the experience of refugees, particularly refugee children in this case, that some of them want to talk about what they've been through and some of them don't want to discuss it at all. Maybe later they will, but that tends to be the, tends to be the experience of people who've gone through uh, these ordeals. But certainly, um, certainly, um, certainly when, they, when they get to Britain, they are determined 
uh, to be to have make a success of it, you know, and a lot of them say they want to make a contribution to public life in Britain. Uh, I mean, I was talking about one Syrian boy standing outside Parliament in 2016 at the time, I think, and um, and he said, "You know what I want to do in life?" And he pointed to the Palace of Westminster and said, "I want to become an MP." Well, I said that's not a bad idea. I think you should meet one or two MPs first before you finalise on that. But yes, it's this wish to be to be normal and to be part of public life. And one of the other things we can all do, going back to your early question, is this. <clears throat> I, I can't find a better word for it, but we must, our responsibility is surely to normalize life as much as possible for refugees who come here, particularly child refugees. <clears throat> and and we, we normalize life for them by trying to make it possible for them to do all the things that people of their age do uh, who lived in this country all, all, all their lives. <laughs> and so it's great. Sport is great. There's, um, there's, a, there's a local group where I live uh, who have a, a weekly event for refugees and they have refugee groups making food and so on. I've been to football matches with refugee children playing with, with other children. All of this is intended to make life as normal as possible. But can I just say one other thing? <laughs> I, I was involved in setting up a project to do with mental health. A very difficult issue because um, um, some local authority leaders said to me, after money, mental health support for refugees is probably their biggest challenge. And there's a patchwork of support. And I had a psychiatrist to talk to some of the local authorities on my behalf to discover what was being done. And, and it is really a patchwork. In some local areas, there's excellent support. In some, it's not nearly, nearly as good as all that. And I'll tell you a little story. One refugee, and we, we mustn't patronize, I say this, I must remember, we must not patronize refugees by saying, because you're a refugee, you've got a mental health problem. That's the worst thing to do. And this boy said, don't treat me as if I've got a mental health problem. I want to play football. I want to study. I want to learn. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a mental health case. So these are all very difficult issues. And if I could say, one of the reasons why mental health is so difficult is this, that if you, wanted, if, if you, need, if you have to use an interpreter, and they pick up English pretty quickly. But one of the things we've got to make sure is there are English lessons uh, for all refugees. Otherwise, they can't function in our society. But um, going to, if you're using an interpreter, it's very easy to say to an uh, Afghan boy or something, what do you want to eat? It's very, much more difficult to talk about mental health. It's much more nuanced. And, and unless you have an interpreter who is understanding of mental health, you can lose some of the subtlety and therefore the ability to be, to be supportive. So that is quite a difficult area, which, which I'm simply flagging up as one that if you are wanting to get in, into a conversation with local councillors, you, you, may, you, may, you, may you, you, may, you may want to mention it. But the, the experience of, of them has been awful. Somebody said, uh, somebody said once, why are there so many Afghan boys coming? This is before the Taliban took over completely. Very simple answer. The Taliban were recruiting young men, young boys, into their army, even before they took over. And families didn't want their uh, boys to be killing other Afghans. They didn't want them to be caught in an army. And so they made sure they, they, they got them out of the country, even if it meant paying people traffickers. So these are experiences that, 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 that young people have been through. And everyone will have their own experiences. And there's some lovely stories. Uh, there's a lovely book I read about um, uh, a boy from the Horn of Africa, I think Somalia, was it, or somewhere around there, who'd escaped. Uh, and, and he went through across, across the, the, the Mediterranean and had a terribly difficult time in France and eventually made it to England. But because he knew about horses, because he'd been brought up in a village in, in Africa where, where, where horses were used, he, he actually got a job working, working at the Queen's stables. Uh, and he was helping to train horses. So there are ways in which people can break through, but we've got to help them to break through and make sure the skills and experience uh, uh, can be put to good use. And I do think I, I was, so if I can just go on for one second more, um, I was in South Wales, this wasn't children, I was in South Wales and there were some uh, Syrian families there in the valleys and everything was fine, except they didn't speak English and there was nobody to teach them English. And they were desperate to get jobs and to work so that they could contribute. And this is similar for children. Uh, what they want is to get their education. There's a desperate wish to deal with the education that they've lost through, through the fighting, the conflicts they've escaped from and the terribly long journey they had coming to safety. It is extraordinary, you know, across these 
millions and hundreds of millions of people who've been displaced over the past century, the ways in which these themes thread through, you know, this desire to contribute, this desire to work. Certainly, I mean, I study you know, refugees from the Holocaust period, which is a long time ago, but one sees similar threads. Um, and I wonder if I can use that to come back to your experience. One of the things that's always struck me about the way you tell your story is you say, oh, children today face much greater hardship than we do it. We did in 1939, you know, and you kind of um, present your story in that way as, as much kind of easier, much, much, a much lesser hardship than what children are experiencing today. And, and your story of a refugee as a refugee in this country has certainly been a one of upward mobility, obviously, and and success. And I wondered if you could say just a little bit about um, the, the Jewish refugee experience in this country um, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, and how, how you see that in comparison with other immigrant groups. Oh, that's a pretty, pretty difficult question, because, because of course, a lot of my uh, awareness of Jewish refugees uh, before the war was based upon the perceptions of a six-year-old or, or as they became a seven or eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my perceptions may not have been quite as uh, sharp, well, they wouldn't have been as you know, sharp uh, as, as I think they are about, about refugees today. So I, 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 I can't always answer the question in that way. But look, um, I think a lot of the Jewish refugees who, who managed to escape the Holocaust um, I think they, the, even those that were detained and interned on the Isle of Man, uh, as a distant cousin of mine was, um, uh, you know, they overcame that with a real determination. Uh, and I, I, I say to refugees today, don't hold back. I, I, I held back in terms of politics for a long time because I felt with my background, I, I couldn't do it. It wasn't suitable. Or it wouldn't be appropriate. Or I wouldn't be accepted. Uh, and, and I think what, what I say to people is, Go for it. Don't hold back. And I think that the, the, the Jewish refugees who came to Britain had that. I think they had that feeling. We've got to make the most of this. And we, we're not going to hold ourselves back and, and we're going to go for it. Now, some refugee groups do that more, more than others. And I think a lot of the Jews came with, with transferable skills. Some other refugees don't necessarily have such transferable skills. They've got to learn a new set of skills. And I think, again, there is a distinction there. But I, I think a lot of the Jews brought skills with them and were able to, as it were, do it, provided the war, wartime situation here allowed them to. So it, it's a more difficult thing. Uh, you asked me in, in an earlier question about my background. Look, I think the cause of refugees and the cause of child refugees should not depend upon the personal experience of the individual putting the argument but it would be quite uh, naive if i suggested that i wasn't influenced by my own background and sometimes when i talk to refugee boys and they know my background i immediately have a have a sort of a rapport with them because they are they sense that i understand uh, I, I understand uh, what what they've been through a bit better than a lot of other people they've met, uh, and uh, I was um, I was reminded recently. Uh, I spoke at a school some oh some years ago, uh, in in, in Kilburn, and um, a lot of the children in the school were either immigrants or refugees. And at one point, just as a little bit of lightheartedness, I said, "Look, I said um, um, as a politician." Uh, you know, English is my third language. I spoke Czech and German when I came to England. And, I, and I, I, well, at age of six, of course, one learns lang languages pretty quickly. But I said to the, I said to the, the school students, I said, look, um, uh, if somebody says I, I, I've made a bad speech, which I'm sure I do often, but they don't always tell me. But I say to them, look, it's my third language. How good are you in your third language? And instead of laughing mildly, they stood up and applauded because they suddenly understood that I understood what, what their situation was. Yeah, well, I imagine that's got to be extraordinarily powerful. I mean, just on a very basic level, um, recognizing the human experience of the other, I think is something that sadly doesn't happen a lot, certainly in the historical testimonies of refugees that I've read. That's such, it's a recurring theme, the sense that society doesn't get it. Yeah, well, um, I, let me. Can I just tell you a little story? I, I'm probably, I'm going way away from the question you want to ask, so forgive me, but I'm not behaving very well. Look, um, tell you a story. Before the pandemic, Fulham and Chelsea Football Foundations decided to have an evening training, giving football training to refugees. Now it was only boys. I should have argued the girls should do it as well, but you know, it was a great evening. Guy Lineker helped, and we had you know 30 or 40 refugee boys on Fulham football pitch 
being taught a bit about football and so on. And when I was their age, I'd have loved to have a chance like that. Now, the idea was to give them the opportunities. Now, that was a above average opportunity to give them a chance. And I think that type of welcome was terrific. And I'm sure they will remember for the rest of their lives kicking a football around on Fulham football gun, particularly as Fulham and I are back in the Premiership. So, you know, these things all these things all matter. Uh, but I think it's the, under, it's the understanding, just what you mentioned. I think they do welcome the fact that somebody may well understand them a little bit better than other people. And, and I think they, they, they welcome that and they do show an appreciation of it. Certainly when I first went to Calais and, and they told me, I, they told them I was coming and they came up to me and thanked me. You know, and it, it was quite uh, uh, humbling uh, humbling at, at, at how that happened. The other humbling thing, if I can slip this one in, is that in all the refugee camps, particularly Calais on the Greek islands, I've met volunteers, young people who volunteered to give a year or two of their lives to helping refugees. And they are mostly from this country, but not entirely. They're very impressive people who get very little praise for what they do. And yet it's a fantastic thing in very difficult conditions to help to provide food and clothing and bedding and so on uh, for, for young people in these refugee camps. So we, we've got a good generation of young people and we shouldn't forget there are some pretty good people in this country who do that. Absolutely. Um, so we, we will forgive you your um, your misbehavior, but I'm afraid we're going to keep you working hard because we can, we're having some uh, fascinating questions coming in through the chat. Uh, there's a great deal of interest. So I'm going to turn to, to those of you who are with us tonight and please do keep your questions coming. I'm going to start with a question from uh, Gillian Ansel Browner, who says, um, I recall that World Jewish Relief addressed the issue of acceptance of child refugees with our parents as an issue for further policy reflection. This happened in a talk about case research into those few who were later reunited with their survivor parents, often in disastrous circumstances. The table on the question was that if 10,000 children could have been saved, surely Britain could have also accepted their parents who were all educated or productive people. Did you want to comment on that? Yes, yes, uh, yes. I, I, I welcome the question, and I, 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 I certainly agree. Now, look, some parents did make it, but it was in, in, in exceptional circumstances. The norm was not to. Now, the, the obsession, obsession that the government seems to have is that if we take a child, then the child will bring a bring family, uh, and the numbers will escalate. But I, I think that that is the wrong approach. I think, provided they are members, of, proper members of the family, and not not. Not a wide, not the wider family, but I think I think it is right, uh, and and I think in thirty in thirty eight thirty nine we should have done that, uh, and and, uh, and 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 uh, but but I I don't I I wasn't aware how much discussion there was of that. Uh, I during the war I was at a boarding school run by the Czech government for Czech refugee children, is in Wales, uh, and and uh, they weren't all Jewish, but many of them were. And and some of them had had family here, some of them didn't. But it, it was a real mixture, and uh, quite depressing for those that didn't have any family here because they were virtually orphaned, even though the Czech government in exile tried to tried to look after them. So the answer to the question is yes, I think we should do that. Mm. We should have done it. Thank you. Um, we have a question now from Benjamin Carey, who says, my mother also arrived in Harwich before the war. The UK government's current immigration policies are shameful, but the Labour Party is now competing to advocate equally anti-refugee policies. How can public opinion change politicians' inhumanity? Well, I'd like to talk to you, Benjamin, a bit more. Uh, look, I passionately want a Labour government. But, it, but it, I, I'm not so naive as to say it'll do all the things that I would like them to do as regards refugees. Of course, it will. no government will be good enough because we've got to keep pushing them. But but I'm not sure. I was listening to Yvette Cooper, Shadow Home Secretary. I know her well, fairly well. I, I think her policies, she's already said that there'll be no Rwanda policy and so on. I, I, I don't want to make this party political because there are conservatives who are, who are, who are very good and keen on a decent refugee policy. So, uh, but I, I think the Labour, Labour, Party, Labour Party policy present, it won't be good enough, but it, 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 will, it is better than the, than, than the, than, than the present governments. So I say that without wishing to make this into a party political discussion, but because I, I've heard of Ed Cooper, she was the one with whom I first discussed my amendment when she said to me, look, there's a golden opportunity here that this bill's going through. So I got, the, probably I got the idea from her more than from anybody else. Uh, and, and I found consistently when I've moved amendments uh, of the sort 
on the issues that we're talking about, um, and, and they've gone through the Lords, where they go through quite well, usually, um, uh, the Labour Party has totally supported them in the Commons. So I, 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 I can't agree with, your, with, with that bit of your comment. Thank you. So I'll move on to the next question. I don't have the name of the questioner, um, but the question is, and it's a more challenging one about uh, refugees, that asks, how do you differentiate between those coming here for economic advantage rather than merely fleeing a despotic regime? Uh, it's a very challenging, it's a very challenging question, because of course uh, the, the thing gets a bit muddied in some of the political rhetoric that, that is, atta is attached to issues. Look, what we have to have, and what every country should have, is a proper and fair way of assessing whether people qualify, people fleeing, whether adults or children, whether they qualify in terms of the United Nations Geneva Convention. And that is to say, uh, people who actually um, have a well-founded fear of persecution on grounds of race, religion, and so on. Uh, and and uh, uh, I, just, I, just, I just think that it's challenging to distinguish. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong about having people migrating for economic reasons. People have done that since the beginning of time, but it doesn't qualify one for a refugee. So there's a higher human rights case for refugees than there is for others. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be wel welcoming to, 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 to migrants. I think what we have to do, given we seem to have labor shortages all over the place at the moment, uh, what we have to do is have a sensible migration policy uh, where we actually uh, identify people that we need for our workforce and, and, and then we encourage that we encourage them or welcome welcome to come here. But the process of determining whether somebody is a migrant or, or refugee is a difficult one. There have to be proper rights of appeal, which is one of the arguments against sending people to Rwanda. Because how can we be sure that if if, if they want to appeal against an adverse decision, how can we be sure that they uh, the, the, that they actually have, have their rights in that country? It's you know the, the uh, look. If we take the people who've crossed the channel, um, I can't talk about the ones that arrived in dinghies just recently, but over a period of time in dinghies on the back of lorries, the majority of them are actually given refugee status. They go through the process, so they have a they don't all, but many of them do. And, and I think we have to make sure we have a proper and fair way of doing it. And, and, and let me give you an example of where the, where the government is, is, is not doing that. They've, they've said in the Nationality and Borders Bill, which again, we, we, we passed 20 amendments in the Lords to that bill and, and only one survived, survived the Commons. Uh, but, but in that bill, it basically says, you have to claim asylum in the first safe country you reach. Now on the face of it, that seems okay. But, and there's an enormous but to that, when, when a million Syrians settled in Germany, <laughs> because Angela Merkel made it possible, um, then uh, if they hadn't, if the, if the European policy had been first safe country is one you've got to claim asylum in, then the million would have been would have all been in Greece and Italy and Malta. So it's both not right in practical terms and in policy terms is wrong. And the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, who are surely the guardians of the Geneva Convention, they say no, that's not right, uh, and you can't penalize people because because they've, they've, they've been through another safe country like, like like France the majority of refugees anyway claim asylum in France but they're now going to be punished if and have a lesser chance of getting refugee status under this act uh, if, if they if they cross the channel in ways that are not le in safe and legal routes and that's why we argue that the government should talk to the French and have more safe and legal routes for those uh, for, for, for those for those that have the right to claim asylum. So I have a question now from Jeff Kaur, who, who says, I work as a consultant and trainer in countering human trafficking and modern slavery. My experience is that there is a lack of awareness amongst local authorities and the police about these issues and a confusion about the terminology. Do you agree that the focus should be on adult safeguarding and child protection? I think there should be enormous focus on, on, on safeguarding and, and, and child protection. It's abs absolutely right. Uh, and if local authorities and police forces are not good at this, then the job is to train them uh, so that they have a good understanding of, 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 what, of what's going on. It doesn't mean that somebody who's been trafficked to this country doesn't have a case for being a refugee. They may well be fleeing all the horrors. And indeed, quite a few of the refugee children that I met were trafficked because they, their families clubbed together uh, 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 and, and paid, for them, paid for them to get to safety. Uh, and there are some terrible stories of how the traffickers exploit them, but, but, but I agree with that. And also, 
when children come here, safeguarding is crucially important. I, I agree, Jeff, the questioner, I, I agree with you. And we have to make sure we have the highest possible standards so that young people who get here have the proper safeguarding and, uh, and don't become vulnerable. Uh, and the Home Office is now putting, putting people into hotels and some of, the, some of the children have disappeared. And that is a tragedy because they may well have been trafficked in, 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 into, into some form of criminality internally in this country so we we can't be vigilant enough about that i agree fully um next question is from the honorary vice president of the shanghai jewish refugee museum who asks could you please comment on why china welcomed up to twenty thousand jewish refugees in 1938 when the european countries refused them refuge um he's based in edinburgh um well Look, I understand that. And indeed, when I talked to some of the my fellow Czechs who came on the kinder transport, some of them were united after the war by their parents. Uh, they came on a kinder transport, but, 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 but their parents escaped eastwards to uh, send them to Shanghai. The answer is, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. All I know is that when people were fleeing the Holocaust, as word got around about what the Nazis were doing, then uh, people went in whichever direction they could. And some of them rather than fleeing westwards, where it wasn't so welcoming, uh, they, they fled eastwards. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I can only say it's a tribute to the Chinese government that, that they allowed people to come to Shanghai. Not many, but they, they did come to Shanghai. But I don't know I don't know anything about the politics of China at the time and whether this was easily done or whether it was it was quite difficult. But certainly Europe as a whole was not welcoming and 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 and, and Europe as a whole behaved badly. Mm. Yes, the Shanghai story is an interesting one. It, it was much more about uh, visa regulations that had been allowed to lapse or that and people simply didn't need visas or believed they didn't. And so many German and Austrian Jews uh, were able to find refuge there and, and the vast majority left after the war, of course. Um, right, we have another question now from Nick Sayers who asks, what do you say to the argument that a more liberal refugee policy of the kind you advocate could almost certainly lead to an ugly populist or racist backlash? Well, and that is that is a, that is the problem that I already referred to in terms of um, uh, a, a racist backlash in terms of some of the right wing parties that have won or, or done well in elections in Germany, Italy, Hungary, and so on. Yes, I, I think it is a threat, uh, and that's why I, I think we can't do enough to persuade public opinion to understand what's going on. You know, but you know, you know, we're 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 not the majority necessarily. And when we've got the newspapers displaying hostility, it is quite difficult to counter it. And I know not everybody reads the Guardian and the Observer and the Financial Times and the more the more liberal newspapers on this. And more people re read the Sun and, and, and the Daily Mail, and that is one of the difficulties in a democracy when the main voices. Well, there are there are Twitter and other electronic media, but but when, when the main voices in, in the mainstream media uh, are, are controlled by people who seem to follow a policy of hostility to refugees, now there's been some change in the Daily Mail. I don't know whether it's going to have any effect on it, but 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 I think that is a, that is a problem. And I, I wish I wish I had some better answer. Better answer. I think we. I think all of us have, ju have just got to keep plugging away when, whenever we can, which is why I, I do. I've gone all around the country talking about uh, talking about um, talking about refugees in the case for it, and I welcome the chance, even though uh, I know that I talk to the converted more often than, than, than I do not, and that's why I think I, I love going to schools because the school, as I said earlier, the schools get it, and what's more, I want them to go home and tell their parents. Mm -hmm. Well, well, to that question of what what causes a, a racist or populist backlash, there's a, a, a very good question um, comment that says much of the problem about um, the anti-refugee attitude is because both politicians and the media speak in terms of figures and statistics, um, not in, about individuals and their stories. How can we change the nature of the narrative? Um, can we shift our attitudes by changing policies to enable refugees to work and contribute to the UK? Well, we've got we we as people who are here have got to make sure that refugees can work and contribute and give and are given a chance to do so. Uh, and I, I think it's important that we give as many opportunities as possible for the refugees themselves to tell their stories and explain what they went through uh, 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 and 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 thank the people of Britain. You probably know 
I'm digressing slightly. Uh, uh, off the central lobby in the House of Commons, there is a plaque which was put up about 25 years ago when there was a big um, international gathering of kinder transport children. Uh, and, and it says, a thank you to the people of Britain on behalf of the 10,000 Jewish children from Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia who were given safety in this country and escaped the Holocaust. Uh, uh, and we did a rededication ceremony there about a few years ago where we got the Chief Rabbi and the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Speaker of the Commons uh, to actually rededicate that plaque in terms of the message it sent for, for, for ref refugees today. Um, so I have a question about the, the position of Jews or the role of Jews. And this is a, a notoriously, a I think, a challenging question, particularly for those like you who are in a position of um, authority in a government. I wonder what you think about the particular role of Jews um, perhaps your own role as a Jew, and and, and um, for those of us here who are Jewish, do you think that there is a particular role for Jews to play in welcoming refugees and approaching refugees because of our history, or, or is this a larger human universal issue? Both. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't I don't have much authority. I'm one one lonely little voice in the unelected second chamber of the British Parliament. I do my best with the position I've got, uh, but 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 I don't have that much I don't have that much authority. However, I hope that when we have a Labour government, some of my some of my friends who will be senior ministers will behave not not the way uh, who was it Jeff or uh, Benjamin said earlier, but will behave properly and and and, and, and we'll be happier. Look. Uh, what I found, and I'm, I said the faith communities have been very supportive, particularly the Jewish community, uh, and they've done it, I think, out of an instinct in terms of the traditions, culture and history uh, and beliefs of the Jewish community. I, I better be careful because I, I, I mustn't generalize because, you know, people have to speak for themselves. But, 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 but I think the Jewish community has found itself to be welcoming, bearing in mind a lot of the refugees are Muslims, you know, uh, and, and I think that that's a particularly notable and commendable coach uh, and as i say I, I i've been to so many synagogues uh, uh, and jewish community events uh, and and they're, they're in the forefront i'm not saying the christians and the muslims don't also do it but they seem to do it to a bit of a lesser extent than the jewish community uh, and i found a warmer welcome at jewish events in terms of the message than, than perhaps at others now maybe it's because of my background i don't know but i, I think the jewish community has instinctively responded with more enthusiasm, with more passion, with more commitment, and with more belief than many other groups in this country. Now, don't quote me. <laughs> you know, I don't want to knock the others. The others have done a good job, and and in a way, the Muslims are very self-effacing. They, you know, they, they do it, and they, they don't talk about it very much. But but I was invited. Uh, I had two. Look, uh, I, don't, I won't upset any of you. I hope. I had two about a few years ago. I was invited to a synagogue in West Hampstead where I talked about refugees. And I told them the following night I was going to talk in Trafalgar Square to a Muslim event and open iftar, uh, which at sundown they were, eat, were eating uh, at the end of the fast. And I said in the synagogue that I'm making the same speech to the Muslims as I do in the synagogue. I'm not sure that went down very well. I'm not sure it goes down well here. But you know, the important thing is there is a message. Uh, and I did give a chat. I did have a few minutes to talk to about two thousand people in Trafalgar Square on the refugees, uh, as I did in the synagogue and as I did in 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 many synagogues. So all I can say is, uh, you know, there's been this positive response wow. from the Jewish community. Thank you. Well, on on the question of um, Jewish responsibility, we have a nice contentious question from Benjamin Carey, who says. Um, the conversation began by referencing Rohingya and Ukrainian refugees, but one of the world's largest refugees, refugee communities is the Palestinians living in Jordan, Lebanon and elsewhere. Considering our Jewish experience through the centuries, is there an opportunity for Israel to show leadership by demonstrating more solidarity with Palestinian refugees? Otherwise, isn't there a risk that other countries might use Israel as a justification for not being more open? Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. That's a real nice easy one to to finish finish tonight's uh, event with. <laughs> I want to throw some more softballs after this one. Uh, well, look, um, I, I, okay, I, I, I think I think the plight of the Palestinian refugees in, in Jordan, and other countries, um, has been pretty desperate for a long time. 
uh, and they are being used a bit by politi as, as political pawns, I think, by some of the countries where, where they are. Uh, I think John, John's been better from what I know about it. Uh, and and, and uh, when I was talking to somebody from Oxfam or somewhere, I said, I asked about Palestinian refugees and they said, gosh, people don't ever ask that question anymore. So the answer is, look, the, the golly, I'm not sympathetic to the. I've not been sympathetic to the Netanyahu government. Let me be quite clear. Uh, and and when I was discussing this with a, an Israeli ambassador here some time ago, he said, "Well, of course you can criticise the Israeli government. Uh, they do it in the Knesset all the time." So uh, the, the answer, the, the answer is that I think it is one of it is one of the most one of the unresolved issues in the Middle East: the the, the Palestinian refugees, and, and they are held in camps. Well, they're held in camps. They're in camps. And they're not given any chance to get out and do things. And I'm not sure what it is I would like the Israeli government to do. I'd like the Israeli government to do other things in, in the West Bank. I'm not sure what it is I'd like the Israeli government to do there. Uh, and indeed, what I want to do is to take your question away and discuss it with colleagues, because I'm not sure I've got a good answer for you. I'm sorry, I just don't have one. I'm not sure anybody has a good answer. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so I'll ask a couple more questions um, and then we'll start to wrap up. Uh, one of the questions was about, you had mentioned um, that you talk in schools a lot and the students are very receptive. And um, the person asks, when talking at schools, are the teachers as receptive as the students to the problems of refugees? Well, given the teachers facilitate my going there, I, I, think, I think on the whole they are, yes. Uh, it's just that it's a, when I talk, it's the children that respond, not not the teachers. But I think the fact that schools, some of them, of course, the Jewish schools are very keen. But the, the fact that schools invite me must mean that teachers play some key part in it. And certainly, when I've talked to the teachers, that they've been very welcoming of of of, of what I've done, of, of what I'm doing, in, in trying to put over the arguments. So I, I, the answer is, I find the teachers are receptive. Yes, that's wonderful and very heartening. Um, so as a as a final um, brief question, although I realize that this is as big and as complex as most of the questions that have been posed to you tonight, but I wondered if you could just tell us your views on the on the planned new Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre next to Parliament. Yeah, if you let me at the end of it, just tell a little anecdote about something else. Look, uh, look, I, I I'm I've been lobbied on both sides about about, about that new new centre next to Parliament, uh, and I. I I think it's a good location. I think near Parliament is good. People can visit Parliament. They can also visit that centre. Uh, I don't think it's causing any particular environmental damage. Uh, uh, I don't understand quite why so many people are so angry about it and think it should be somewhere miles away. And so I, I, I like to understand the arguments against me when I so I, I, I'm better I'm better aware of what the issues are. But I've just never quite understood. I'm delighted it's going to be there. We cannot do enough. Uh, I've been to Holocaust Education Trust uh, events and so on. We cannot do enough to spread to spread the word. And if having that centre next to Parliament. Uh, will do that, then it's a good location because a lot of people go there. People go there uh, who, who, who are Western, so are looking at what's going on there. Uh, I think I think it's a I think I think it's a good location, and I, I've I've refused to sign petitions opposing it in that in that location. I welcome its being there or, or existing at all, but I think I think it's a good place. I think the arguments against were partly that it it, it seems to be a political project that was much more about the initially the political party that was putting it forward then about the issues itself that the issues themselves but also that the resources that were being put into this center could more usefully be put elsewhere but perhaps that's a larger debate that we want to go into here well, and, and also you had said that you had an anecdote that you wanted to share with well, us I wanted, and it, just if it's a finish it's a, if, if it's a finishing thing look look i understand i understand that but uh, about the center uh, uh, all i can say is i wanted to happen and I think it is most important that we use that and every other every other device to, to spread the word. I want I want to tell two anecdotes, if I, if I may. May I do that? Of course. Well, well look, one of them because uh, I'm, I'm anxious to spread the word. And I was invited some before the pandemic. I was invited to a school in Bethnal Green, which was a maintained school, but it was pretty well all Muslim boys. And the project they were doing was was anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, which I thought was pretty inspiring of the teachers to get the Muslim boys in that part of London 
to actually look at it. And the first question I got from a 14 year old boy when I, I, when I said my piece was, what do I say to people who, who deny the Holocaust ever happened? And I thought that was a terrific question because it came from a Muslim boy in a Muslim part of East London where, where the prevailing attitudes may not be all that sympathetic. And, and I thought it's a sign that the teachers are doing a good job uh, and, and, and the young people are responding. Okay. And my last one is just a little anecdote. I was in Zafari in Jordan. That's a very big refugee camp, about 70 to 80,000 people. Physically better than Calais or Lesbos and so on, because it's got um, water, electricity, sanitation, prefab buildings. And I was talking to a 17 year old Syrian and I asked him about himself. And he said, well, I finished my education in the camp. It's good. I've tried to get a job in the camp and I can't. I've tried to get a job outside the camp and I can't. What do I do? And it made me realize that one of the most important things we all have to offer refugees is hope. Hope, because where there is no hope, there is only despair. And that is a terrible thing to impose on our fellow human beings. But where there is hope, we can do something. And I, I think one of the things that those of us believe in the rights of refugees is that we're offering hope in whatever way we can, in local communities or whatever it is, we're offering them hope of a decent life and a decent future. And it is that hope that is the important challenge. And I'd like to feel, I would like to feel that all Europe would cooperate in, 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 in approach policy to refugees. It's a fall on hope with some of the governments like the Hungarians, but I'd like to feel that all, all, all Europe will, will do that. But hope is my message. Hope is what we have to offer. Yeah. Well, what a beautiful note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Alf. Despite your self-effacing comments, you certainly have more influence than, than most of us sitting here tonight. And the energy and the commitment and the humanity and the sensitivity with which you approach these issues is really an inspiration. It has been um, a great honor and most inspiring to hear you answer our questions. Um, I'm going to pass back now to Aviva and Eve, but from me and on behalf of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, thank you so much for, for um, such inspirational insights. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley, and thank you, everybody. Um, just to say that what I'm going to now do before I carry on speaking myself is open the chat up. Um, I hope you understand we've kept it closed during the actual conversation because we wanted to allow our speakers to be able to really focus on the conversation with each other and have you focus with on what they were saying and be able to listen. But we do know that there are members of the audience who would like to have their own say briefly, put a few comments to each other and to Alf. So you should be able to do that from now onwards. And um, while that is happening, um, I'm just going to say on my behalf, a huge thank you to both Lord Alf Dubbs and Dr Shirley Gilbert, who have been championing these issues for many years both of them through research and through advocacy and we're so grateful to them um i know that um Bidet Brith UK are going to do a proper thank you in a moment so I will leave it there but just to say that in our magazine Jewish Renaissance we do pick up many of the issues that are being talked about um, and we do a lot of international focus at the moment particularly on what's happening in the Ukraine so and and we did um we did an issue on Afghanistan a few months ago too so if any of you aren't subscribers you're very welcome to be. I will send out an offer to B'nai B'rith members afterwards so you can subscribe a little bit more cheaply. Um, but we will hopefully continue to cover both refugee and Holocaust issues and be the voices that we can, because I hope you all agree that from what we've been hearing tonight, it needs all of us to speak up as well as people like Lord Dubbs. Now, on that note of speaking, I'm going to pass over to Eve and as I say she's going to speak for a few moments now but we're also it's over to you you should all be able to speak to each other in the chat now and I know Naomi amongst others particularly wanted to so please have your say. Right well before I uh, thank our guest speakers I'd like to thank you Aviva for uh, being our partner 
And I'd also like to thank the Brene Britt team, including Lydia, and uh, you know, for making this uh, event completely possible. So, Lord Dubbs, Elf, as I've been told you want to be called, and Shirley, Professor Gilbert, it really has been a tremendous honor having you both here tonight. And Alf, you've certainly demonstrated how your experience as a refugee yourself has shaped your life working for refugee rights and all the many causes that you've uh, been speaking about tonight. You've shown how it is possible to succeed given the right opportunities and conditions. And you use the word hope, which is all that we can uh, hope and believe for. The situation of refugees today is as great a tragedy as it was for the past waves of refugees. But as with many of their uh, predecessors, there is, as we've said, hope and support to enable integration and the building of a new life in the countries that they have found themselves. So, Shirley, you, as a distinguished historian, have been able, through your expertise, to elicit so much from health in the responses to your questions. And renewal has been our theme of this conversation. And the way you have brought out the positive uh, aspects and the possibilities for the refugee, we certainly have much to think about. So, Thank you both once again, and I'm going to virtually present certificates for you both that you will receive in the post. Um, this is yours, uh, Alf, and I'll read what it says that the Benebrit UK Feed the Hungry program in Kiryat Gat, Israel, assists the Kiryat Gap Foundation in providing meals for some 300 families and many of those have been refugees themselves coming from um, Russia, uh, Ethiopia and, and now well, Ukraine and also our Bonabra Medical uh, Aid Programme in Kiev, Ukraine, which provides medicines for around 75 people, many of them Holocaust and Second World War veterans, some of whom have been right as Gentiles. And I know from our coordinator for the uh, Ukraine appeal that at the moment they are having tremendous problems not just the sourcing of the medicines for these elderly people, but being able to deliver them. And it really is a struggle as you can well understand. So finally, I'd like to thank all the audience and um, for your contribution and for supporting our uh, program tonight. So if I can ask you to give a, a round of applause, thank you very much. So I don't know, Aviva, whether uh, something else is going to happen now. <laughs> I think that is it. What I'm going to suggest is if people want to unmute themselves, they're very welcome to actually give a voice round of applause or say any comments. And we'll just give it a couple of minutes and then we will finish off the seminar. But, okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I can hear lots of people. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much. And we hope to see everybody again at future events. Thank you. Thank you. Now people are going. Inspirational, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, thank you, Shirley, for your good questions. And mm. thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you both Shirley and Alf. It has really been inspirational. <laughs>